Hi, it's chapel time again, and I get the privilege to talk to you, even though we can't be face to face, at least get the opportunity to talk to each of you in your individual classes. And it's February. There's lots going on in February, a lot of important events, a lot of historical things we look at, but there's also something that's part of February that we all know of, we're going to hear about, and that, of course, is Valentine's Day. Now, we could spend the whole chapel talking about who the real person Valentine was and the significant role he played in early Christianity and what that should mean for us, but we're not going to this time. So we're going to talk about Valentine's Day, specifically its theme, which is, of course, love. That wonderful thing that we think so much about, that we write songs about, that we talk about, poetry is written about it, greeting cards, chocolate, all this about love. It seems like love is in the air. I think that's a line in a song. We get so fixated on it, and it's this wonderful thing, this great feeling, love. It gets us excited. We dream about it. But what is it? What does it really look like? Does it matter? Is it simply a gimmick to sell gifts and jewelry? We're going to take a moment and think about this thing called love. Because God actually talks a lot about love. And it's something that we actually should be thinking about, but not simply just in, in a romantic, Twitter-pated kind of way, because it's actually something much more than that. So we're going to talk about love. If that makes you go, just bear with me, and we'll work it out together. But before we get into what the Bible says about love, let's start by going to the person who gave us the Bible, let's talk to God. Let's pray together. Father, thank you that we can talk about this thing called love, this small word with such a huge meaning, and we can go to the source of it, that we can go to you to find out what this is, what it means, and why it's important to us. So Lord, right now I ask in our school, to all those who are listening to this chapel, to those who may be watching it online outside of school, Lord, I pray that your spirit would remove distractions from us. I pray that you would focus our minds and hearts. That as we look at your word, as we consider this thing called love, that you would speak to us. That you would change us for your glory in Jesus Christ. Amen. We're going to start looking this morning in the Bible in a little letter near the end of the Bible. A little letter written by the Apostle John. In this letter, he talks about this thing called love. And he talks about it in how we should treat one another. Chapter 4, starting at verse 7. So this is the first epistle of John, chapter 4, starting at verse 7. Dear friends, let us love one another. For love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only Son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice 
for our sins. So that's where we're going to begin. In this question, what is love? Is it a feeling? Oh, I, I feel the feelings every time I see this person. Oh, my heart starts to beat so fast. Oh, I, 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 feel, I feel faint. Now, that could be love, or that could be the onset of a heart attack. So you probably want to keep a close eye on those feelings when they come up. But seriously, oftentimes when we talk about love, we talk about these waves of emotion, these signs of affection. Sometimes we'll even use love in a very strange way. You'll hear someone go, oh, I love my parents. And then a moment later, you'll hear them say, I love this ice cream. Now, I hope there is some difference between this love toward the parents, this affection, and their affection towards a frozen sugary confectionery they are about to consume. Do you see what I mean? There are differences here. Oftentimes we use love as a way to talk about something that we simply have an appreciation for. Something that, for some reason, it pleases us, we have an appreciation for it, and we express that appreciation by saying, I love this. Now, the problem with that way of thinking, that that's what love is, it's simply an appreciation for, is that it doesn't match the definition that God just gave us, through the Apostle John, of what love is. Let me show it to you again. We're told here, he begins, he's telling us how, that we should love each other. And then he begins to explain this of what love is. First of all, he says, love is something that comes from God. And by definition, God is love. So love isn't some little trivial thing. If you're going to be, I don't need love in my life, it is not necessary. You need to realize that love is not a trivial thing. Because the God of the universe, the God who made everything and holds everything together by the word of his power, says, I am love. That immediately tells us that love is, Whatever it really is, is something huge. Because it's just been equated with the single greatest being in all eternity. God himself. So he says he is love. So there's the beginning of our definition. God is love. So whatever this love is, it's absolutely massive. And then God helps to unpack this for us. By saying this, this is how God showed his love among us. So he said, so we would understand love. So we're told that God is love, but, but God is so huge and so massive and so beyond our understanding. We don't even begin to comprehend how big God is. God creates everything. We can't grasp that. We don't even have a, a grasp yet exactly how big the universe is let alone that God created it. We don't understand how all the parts of the universe, from those tiny subatomic particles to these massive solar systems, how they all fit and balance and work together. But God holds it all together by the word of his power, we're told in his word. So then we're told that God is love. Well, how do we grasp what that looks like. So he says, this is how God showed us what love looks like. This is how God is helping you and I define this word, love. And he said, this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, 
but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. So he's saying here that you want to know about love. Well, first of all, understand this. Love manifests itself as an action. Did you get that? Love manifests itself, so it is revealed as an action. So, in order for love to be present, there is an action. There is a way that love presents itself actively. It's not passive. So when I sit back and go, I love that sunset. Forgive me for the corny accent. We can say, well, okay, so I'm affectioned for, it, it interests me, but really that doesn't fit the God-sized definition of love. When someone says, I love a special person in my life, it's assumed that that love will be displayed through action. So, we go back to old times, and we have, there's this famous scene of Queen Elizabeth I. And Queen Elizabeth I supposedly was walking along, and, and there's many variations of this story, and one of her courtiers, this man who was hoping to win her affections, is walking with her, and he's got this fancy cape. Back in the days when you got to wear cool capes and you didn't have to be a superhero. He has this fancy cape. And as she is walking along, there is this muddy spot in front of her. Where if she were to walk into that muddy spot, it would soil her very fancy shoes and the edge of her beautiful gown, which reaches down and touches the ground. And seeing that... This man, this courtier, who has affection for her, who wants to show his love for her, whips off his cape in dramatic fashion and lays it out across the mud. So she can walk across his cape and not get her shoes or the edge of her gown muddy. So do you see what I'm saying there? There was an action that showed what he said he felt. You may look and go, that's kind of corny, couldn't they have walked around the puddle? Anyway, that's, that's the story. However true it is, it's been told and retold many times. Now for God, he tells us that his love manifests in an action too. And his action was to send his one and only son into the world. Because as you know, because we've talked about in Bible classes and you've heard in chapels before, we had a problem. And that problem is our sin which separated us from God. And if God said, I love these people I've created, but he simply left us with no hope, there would be no proof of this love. But God says, this is how I, my love is manifested. My son came into the world and laid down his life for humankind. So that anyone who puts their trust in his finished work will be saved and have eternal life. As we hear in the Gospel of John, in John 3.16, that verse that so many people have memorized in Sunday school or at school or in Awana or in other programs like that. For God so loved the world, if he so loved the world, then there would be an action. For God so loved the world, he sent his one and only Son, so that whosoever should believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And then God goes farther because he says, know this, because oftentimes we think with love too, even if we're thinking of an action, we wait for someone to love us. So maybe you're there and you go, 
whoever treats me the best, I will love them in return. It's sort of like ROI, you know, what's going to happen here. And God points out that the origin of his love for us doesn't come from how we treated him. I want you to think about that for a moment. God's incredibly extravagant, huge, amazing action of love in the laying down voluntarily of his son's life on the cross and then rising again victorious over the grave, doing that, that incredibly, eternally extravagant display of love was not in response to how much we were loving God. Because at that point, we didn't love God. We didn't even know how to love God. God loved us first. And because he loved us so much that he found a way to redeem us and to give us new life in him, now it's possible because of this new life we have in Jesus that we are actually able to love God and to love others. And that love, just as God's love is manifested in action, our love is manifested in action as well. So because God so loved me, and I put my trust in His action of love, and I have new life in Him, now I have God's power in me to love Him back. To love him back in worship. To love him back in obedience. To love him back. Because Jesus also tells us in the Gospels that we show God our love for him when we do what he says. With the right heart. With the right motive. When we love God. And part of doing what he says is obeying his commandments. And that's hard. So when we say that we know God, we've accepted Jesus, and we say that we love God, but we don't do what he says, the truth isn't really in us. Because our love will be manifested by our actions. In the same way that if a person says they love someone else, and there is no proof of that, then you have to question if the love is there. There's an old saying they used to say to young men and women when they were beginning to court someone, beginning to look for someone who would become their husband or their wife. And the saying goes like this, said, look at the person you are thinking that you may marry. Watch how they treat the people who are already around them. Watch how they treat their parents. Watch how they treat their siblings, their brothers and sisters, older or younger. Watch how they treat the people they work with or go to school with. Watch how they treat the people who get in their way. Because how they treat those people will eventually be how they will treat you. Because from the abundance of our hearts, our actions are manifest. So let's go back to see what else John has to say. So he's told us that God is love. He's told us that love is manifested in action. He's told us the action God has done to show his love for us. That he loved us first. He didn't love us because we were so loving toward him. It wasn't a response thing. He loved us when we didn't love him first. Now let's see what this love does in our lives. Verse 11. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is made complete in us. We know that we live in him and he is in us because he has given us of his spirit. 
And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in him, and he in God. And so we know and rely on the love God is for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in Him. In this way, love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment, because in this world we are like Him. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear, because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because He first loved us, so this part here is speaking specifically if you say that you have accepted Jesus in your life. You've trusted what he did on the cross for you. You put your trust in him and he is now coming to your life. You are a new creation in him. So the love of God is at work in you. And just as his love is an action, so our love through him should be an action as well. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God, yet hates his brother, he is a liar. For anyone who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And he has given us this command, whoever loves God must also Love his brother. So I want you to think on that. This is a command that God has given us. He says, if you have experienced my love, so that now my love is at work in you, then you should love the people around you. Now, just as the love of God was not this just this pleasant affection toward. Just as the love of God was not this cutesy, twitter-pated kind of thing that looks more like indigestion than it does actual feelings, in the same way, we are to love the people that God puts around us. And God actually says it through John in pretty tough words. He says, if you say you love God, but you hate the people around you, then you don't actually love God. Okay, think about that for a second. If you say you love God, but you hate people around you, then the love of God is not actually at work in you. Something is hampering the love of God in your life. Because as you experience and I experience more of the love of God in our lives... We are able, through him, to love the people around us. And again, I'm not talking about romantic fixations. I'm not talking about sweet affections. I'm talking about that general care in action of the people around you. If I can walk through daily life and I can pass the people I interact with and they are in need or they're struggling or there's they just need the comfort of a friend and I can walk by oblivious then the love of God is hampered in my life why because God never deals with us that way God is always there at work in me even when I am the least lovable, and there are lots of times when I know, because of my attitudes, because of my actions, because of my tendency to slip back into old ways and old habits, I can become very unlovable. I can be hard in the way I talk and respond to people. I can be cold toward people. And yet, God still loves me. 
He is still there to pick me up when I intentionally walk the wrong way and fall on my face. God, in his great love for me that saved me, also picks me up and carries me. And we've talked about this before in chapel. But now that love needs to then come through in my interactions with those around me. No one in my scope of influence should feel unloved by me. Does that mean that you like everybody and are chummy with everyone? No. So let's, let's separate that right now. There is a difference between love and action and like. I like doing things with people of similar interest. That's just a natural thing. We have personalities, we have interests, certain people gravitate towards certain people, certain people like certain activities, and we gravitate to those. So let's not confuse interests and similar likes with love. Because love is a much bigger thing. So I may gravitate towards certain people in my activities, in my interests, in my conversations, but I am still aware and conscious of all the people in my circle. So my care and my concern is still the same, whether you and I like the same sports or not. Whether you and I talk about the same movies or not. If the love of God is working through me, your value to me is not dependent on whether we match up with likes. It's dependent solely on the fact that God has said you're valuable. And because he says you're valuable, I will love you. I will care for you. And sometimes that love is made most powerfully clear in those moments and those times when there is nothing else that would connect when there's nothing else that would match us up. Sometimes there may be lots of reasons for there, not only is there no like, but there may be opposition. There may be reasons why we would say, I don't like that person. And yet the love of God at work in a person who is following God through Christ is enabled by God's love to show love and action to those who for any other reason would seem, humanly speaking, to be unlovable. I'm going to tell you a quick story. There was a fellow who joined, well, didn't join, he was drafted into the American military during the Vietnam War. And he was there, and he said there were other guys similar to him in their habits and such. They lived a rough life, but they were put in groups of men. And among them, there was a young man who was a follower of Jesus Christ. He had put his trust in what Jesus Christ had accomplished on the cross for him. And he said immediately... As the guys are getting to know each other, they pretty quickly picked out that this fellow was a follower of Christ. They referred to him as born again. They had little use for this young man and his interest in Jesus. And they began to find it entertaining since he didn't engage in the, the conversations they engaged in. They, he did, wouldn't listen to the filthy stories they told and the, the filthy jokes they talked about. They began to torment him. They began to bully him, to single him out, because it's in all the stress of military basic training, it was a way to let off steam to go after him. And so first they did little things just to insult him. Then they began to ramp it up. Then they would do things like right before uh, inspection, when everything had to be perfect in their barracks, a few of the guys would go distract this young man, and then they would pull all his things apart. 
so when the inspecting sergeant came through and came to his bunk, it was a mess. And there would always be punishment to follow. And he got more and more punishments, which meant he had more and more extra duties to do. And they made his life harder and harder. But they said the thing was, the more difficult they made this young man's life, the thing that struck one of these soldiers who recounted the story later, he said, the more we made his life more difficult, the more we saw something different in him. Because though we did evil to him, he never did evil back to us. He said, one night we saw him and he was praying. And so we took a few of the guys, grabbed their boots and flung their boots at him and hit him with their combat boots. Well, they yelled insults and insulted him and blasphemed God. And then they went to sleep. He said, in the morning when they got up, their boots were by their beds. And the young man had, in the night after they'd gone to sleep, he had polished their boots for them. Because they hadn't, in their carelessness, hadn't done that. So what they had done to bring hurt to him he brought love back to them. And this continued and continued. And finally, one of the men grabs this phone and goes, Why do you do this? And the young man said back to him, He said, If you knew how much Jesus has shown his love for me, I can't help but show love to you. It's not a choice for me because I know how God, much God has demonstrated his love toward me in saving me, in carrying me, in strengthening me, in helping me, that I need to show that love to you too. Not just so he could, you know, check a box, oh, look, I've done this good deed, because he genuinely loved that person. Because you see, the more we experience the love of God, the more like God's character we begin to be shaped into. And the more we love people like Jesus loves people. So here's my challenge to you. Right here, right now in this school, I want you to think about those people around you. Just think about them. Especially right now, if you know Jesus Christ, if you put your trust in what Jesus Christ accomplished on the cross for you, you believe that Jesus died for your sins and rose again according to the scriptures. And you believe that you needed him to pay the penalty for your sins and you put your trust in what he did on the cross for you. Say, God, I can't save myself. I can't be good enough. But I thank you that Jesus did this for me. Lord, I need you to change my life. If you've done that, so now God's love is at work in you, I want you to think in your sphere of influence. You'll have the people that you like, who you have connections with, you have natural affections for and interests with. But who are the people that God's put in your sphere of influence that need to see the action of the love of God through you? Who's the person that needs a kind word today? Who's the person that needs somebody to walk alongside them? No, it doesn't mean you have to match up all your interests, but you show them that they have value. Because the fact is, we can't say we love God, who we haven't even seen, if we can't, through his power, love the people around us. In a place where Christians are, no person should feel that they don't know the love of God. No person should feel unloved. They should know that they have value. John repeats this over and over. Love one another. Love one another. 
the early church, when the church first came into existence, one of the ways that people began to know who the Christians were was to say, see how they love each other. Not in some sappy, romantic affection, but in love and action, supporting the person who is hurting, who is feeling beaten down, making sure no one is left out, encouraging and strengthening, speaking words of truth and love to each other. When someone is being pulled down by negativity, maybe it's their own negativity, to speak words of truth and love to them and encourage them in Christ. So that's my challenge for me and for you. If you know Christ, how is the love of God in action in your actions? What can you do today to help someone feel loved. What can you do today so when people look at Halifax Christian Academy and see us, whether we're on the playground or in our classes, whether it's a family visiting the school or hearing about the school, that they will say, see how they love one another. See how they care for one another. You know, in that place, Nobody feels like they're left on the outside. No matter how different or how quirky or whatever particular interests or such you have, no one feels unloved here. Because you see, that love goes beyond Valentine's Day. That goes after, keeps going after the chocolate has long since gone on 50% off. The roses have wilted. The corny cards have been tossed away. That love continues. Let's pray. Father, you have demonstrated what love is for us. You've told us that you are love and then you've shown your love in the most powerful way possible by sacrificing yourself for us. By laying down your life as a payment for our sin. You didn't do it because we were so lovable. You did it because you were so full of love. And you pour that love into our lives when we come to Christ. And Lord, let it flow from us. Lord, I pray that we would love each other in action. Lord, starting with me, starting with each of us, starting with, with staff, starting with students, starting with families, Lord, that we would genuinely care for one another. Not in a faddish way. Not in just something we do for the moment because it's the cool thing to do or because we've been guilted into it, but genuinely as your love flows in us and through us. Lord, that we would love one another. Lord, I pray for our school that we would be a place when people hear of Halifax Christian Academy Beyond anything else, they would say, you should see how they love each other. Lord, do this, I pray, for your glory in Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you. And as always, if you have thoughts or questions or things you want to talk about, I'm around and I'd love to hear from you. Or talk to the other teachers, they would love to hear from you too. But let us love each other.